Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the opening of Wiener Festwochen and the first episode of the School of Resistance. My name is Lara Staal. I'm a curator, writer, maker, and researcher, and I'm more than happy to enter into conversation with artist Milo Rao and Tania Bruguera, whom I will introduce in a bit more detail in a moment. Normally, artist and activist Kay Sara would have opened the Wiener Festwoche today, uh, about two hours ago. She would have uh, been on stage in the Burg Theater in Vienna. But as we all know, COVID-19 changed this scenario drastically. And therefore, we will be watching and listening to her through a video that she made in uh, the north of Brazil, where she's staying right now. Wiener Festwoche would also have uh, organized a series of talks reflecting upon the heritage of theater director and filmmaker Christoph Schlingensief. And one of these conversations would have been between Tania Bulgera and Milo Rao, reflecting upon the work he made 20 years ago, Please Love Austria. And Tania and Milo would have talked about the concept of integration and the idea of artivism. So we're very happy that they're with us, that they are with us today, and that we can open the festival virtually, which is on the same time the launch of a series of online conversations under the title of School of Resistance, an initiative of Milo Rao and Ente Ghent, uh, the city theater of Ghent in Belgium. The School of Resistance takes the dipping of the oil price below zero on April the 20th as a starting, due to the COVID-19 crisis, as a starting point to reflect upon the possible scenarios this current crisis could lead to, and invites experts of change around the world, like politicians, activists, artists, and philosophers, to reflect together. This project is funded and supported by Ente Gent, IAPM, Akademie der Künste Berlin, Kulturstiftung des Bundes, Medico International, and Merve Verlag. In two weeks, the next episode will take place with scholar and environmental activist and author Vandana Shiva and climate justice activist and founder of Youth for Future Africa, Vanessa Nakate. And under the title, Making the World Habitable, we will talk about the situation in India and Central Africa from an environmental point of view. For everyone who's listening, you can send questions uh, by mailing to schoolofresistance at antegent.be or by commenting on the live stream on the Facebook pages of Antegent, Wiener Festwoche, or IAPM, or on Twitter by including hashtag School of Resistance. Before I introdu introduce our guests further, um, I would like to introduce Kay Sara. As we're going to listen to her speech in a moment, and this will be the entry point for a conversation with Milo and Tanya. Kay Sara is an indigenous artist and activist that grew up in the Brazilian state of Amazonas and is committed to the adequate representation of indigenous people and the preservation of their environment against the threat of mining companies and the agribusiness. She will play the role of Antigone in Milo Rao's production of Sophocles, which is titled Antigone in the Amazon. And then I'm honored to now go to her speech. Esta loucura tem que acabar. Este discurso começa com muitos contextos. Eu deveria ter subido hoje ao palco do Burgo Teatro e ter aberto o Festival de Viena. Eu teria sido a primeira indígena a fazer um discurso neste teatro, que dizem ser o maior e o mais rico teatro do mundo. Eu teria começado com uma citação de um clássico europeu, a peça Antígona de Sófocles. Muitas coisas são monstruosas, mas nada é mais monstruoso do que o ser humano. Eu teria vindo até vocês diretamente os nossos ensaios na Amazônia. Uma nova encenação europeia brasileira da peça teatral Antígona. Eu teria feito o papel da Antígona, que se rebela contra o governo creonte 
que não quer permitir o enterro do seu irmão por ser considerado um inimigo do Estado. O coro teria consistido em sobreviventes de um massacre de sem terra pelo governo brasileiro. Teremos realizado esta nova, antiga ou nenhuma estrada fechada que atravessa a Amazônia. Aquelas florestas que estão constantemente em chamas. Não teria sido uma peça, mas uma ação. Não um ato de arte, mas um ato de resistência contra aquele poder estatal que está destruindo a Amazônia. Mas nada disso aconteceu. A estrada que corta a floresta amazônica não estava fechada e eu não interpretei o papel da antiga. Estamos todos espalhados pelo globo novamente. E só nos vemos nas telas como agora. Meus amigos europeus me perguntaram como eu estou indo. Eu estou bem. Estou na Amazônia, no norte do Brasil, nas margens do Royapoque. A natureza me cerca, ela me protege e nos nutre também. Eu vivo no ritmo dos pássaros, cantando e da chuva. E foi realizado em mim um ritual ancestral para minha proteção, feito pela minha família. Pela primeira vez em mais de 500 anos, a Europa e a América estão separadas novamente. Eu pertenço ao terceiro clã do povo tariano, o clã dos trovões. Sou filha da espuma do sangue do deus trovão. Diz o mito que nós tarianos éramos gente pedra, mas nos tempos modernos é, nós assumimos o corpo humano para poder nos comunicar com as pessoas que vinham até nós. Minha mãe do povo tucano me deu o nome de Caissara, que significa aquela que cuida dos outros. No lado de meu pai eu pertenço ao povo tariano. Eu falo com vocês na minha língua materna. Sou uma mistura de muitas coisas, como todo mundo. Sou tariana e tucana. Mulher, atriz, artista, uma resistente. Falo com vocês sendo tudo isso. Nós... Nativos somos chamados de índios, mas eu insisto para que sejamos chamados de indígenas, porque índio é uma palavra ofensiva e pejorativa que foi imposta a nós pelos invasores, para dizer que nós éramos inferiores. Por isso precisamos mudar essa realidade. Eu me tornei atriz para poder falar sobre nós, sobre a nossa existência. Há muito tempo a nossa história é contada pelas palavras dos não indígenas. Agora é hora de contarmos a nossa própria história. Nosso infortúnio começou quando os espanhóis e portugueses chegaram à nossa terra. Primeiro vieram os soldados, depois os religiosos. Junto com os europeus, chegaram as doenças, milhares de povos morreram e outros milhões morreram na, nas mãos dos soldados e do clero. Mas esse acontecimento foi esquecido e não está escrito em nenhum lugar. Assassinaram em nome do único Deus e de uma única civilização, em nome do progresso e do lucro. Alguns trabalharam para eles, negros e indígenas, escravizados e assassinados. Hoje souberam apenas poucos de nós. Eu sou uma das últimas do povo tariano do terceiro clã. E há poucas semanas chegou até nós mais uma doença vinda do exterior, o novo coronavírus. Já deve ter ouvido falar que em Manaus, a capital do estado do Amazonas, a doença está matando de uma forma particularmente terrível. Não há tempo para funerais adequados. As pessoas são enterradas em valas comuns e que são cobertas de terra por tratores. 
Também em muitos lugares do mundo há corpos na rua, como o irmão de Antígono. Os brancos aproveitam agora o caos para penetrar ainda mais profundamente nas florestas. As florestas estão sendo queimadas. O desmatamento aumentou brutalmente. Quem está fazendo isso? Quem cai na mão dos madeireiros é assassinado. E o que o presidente tem feito? O que ele sempre faz? Apertar na mão de seus apoiadores e zombar dos mortos. Desde que o vírus surgiu, ele instruiu a sua equipe a ignorar os povos indígenas. Isso é um apelo para nos matar. Ele quer finalizar esse genocídio que, que, que acontece há mais de 500 anos. Sei que vocês estão acostumados com relatos como estes. Quando já é tarde demais, aparecem os videntes. Quando Cassandra e Tiresias aparece nas tragédias gregas, você sabe que o desastre já tomou seu curso. Você, você gosta dos nossos cantos, mas não gosta do que falamos. E quando você nos escuta, você não nos entende. O problema não é que você não sabe que nossas florestas estão queimando e nosso povo está morrendo. O problema é que você já se acostumou a estes fatos, mas nós não. Então vou dizer o que todos vocês já sabem. Há alguns anos, os fluentes da Amazônia secaram pela primeira vez em memórias vivas. Se não agirmos agora, o ecossistema da Amazônia entrará em colapso. O coração deste planeta vai parar de bater. É o que dizem os nossos xamãs, é o que dizem os seus cientistas. Talvez seja a única coisa que concorde. Nós desapareceremos se não agirmos. Não podemos ser egoístas o suficiente de negar a geração futura de desfrutar, de apreciar o que tem de mais belo, a natureza. E tudo o que ela libera para a nossa sobrevivência. Recebeu muitos baixos assinados por celebridades nas últimas semanas. Vocês querem voar menos, matar menos, roubar menos. Mas como vocês podem acreditar que após mais de 500 anos de invasão, após milhares de anos de subjugação do mundo... Pode vir um pensamento até vocês de que não trará mais destruição. Se você ouvir a si mesmo, você encontrará apenas a sua consciência pesada. Quando vocês viajam pelo mundo, vocês encontrarão apenas a sujeira com a qual vocês nos contaminaram. Não podemos voltar atrás. Mas não podemos mais deixar destruir. Eu não tenho medo por mim. Eu tenho medo pelos nossos descendentes. Então é hora de vocês ficarem em silêncio. Chegou a hora de ouvir. Vocês precisam de nós, os prisioneiros do seu mundo, para poder, para poder se entenderem a si mesmos. Porque a coisa é tão simples, não a ganho nesse mundo, há apenas vida. E é por isso que é bom que eu não esteja hoje num palco do Burger Teatro, que eu não esteja falando agora com vocês como atriz. Porque não se trata mais de arte, não se trata mais de teatro. Nossa tragédia acontece aqui e agora, diante dos nossos olhos. Talvez... Seja isso que me preocupa quando ouço o creão te falar. Quando ele sabe que está errado, ele sabe que o que ele está fazendo é errado. Que é errado em todos os sentidos. Que isso trará sua queda, a queda da sua família, o apocalipse. E ainda assim ele o faz. Ele se critica, ele se odeia, mas continua a fazer o que odeia. 
este, esta loucura deve acabar. Pare de ser como crente, vamos ser como Antígona. Porque quando a ilegabilidade se torna lei, a resistência se torna um dever. Vamos resistir juntos. Vamos ser humanos, cada um, a sua maneira e lugar. Unido pelas nossas diferenças e pelo amor, pela vida que une a todos. Welcome back. The speech you've just heard, uh, the letter of K. Sarah, um, is also published today and tomorrow in several newspapers around the world, like Standard, Taz, Die Takas Zeitung, Le Soir, Le Monde, Republica, De Morgen, NRC, The Stage, and various platforms in Brazil. Maybe before we start talking about the speech, um, I'd like to introduce our guests a little bit further. Unfortunately, Tania Bruguera is not yet with us, which has to do with technical problems. It's not that easy from Cuba to join us online. So we are hoping that she can join us as soon as possible. We will just start uh, the conversation. I will introduce her. Um, so Tania Bruguera is a Cuban performance artist and activist. She's relying on the concept of arte utile, which means useful art. And she uses her work to examine political power structures. Her work has been represented on many places, but amongst others, MoMA and Tate Modern. And Milo Rao is director, author, and artistic director of IEPM, which is the International Institute for Political Murder, and Antigent in Ghent in Belgium. And he's also the initi initiator of these series of conversations of the School of Resistance. Um, so Milo, normally I would have started with asking you and Tanya to give a first response um, on speech as a whole before, let's say, uh, diving a bit deeper in the things she said. Um, but as Tanya is not yet with us, maybe it makes sense that you give us a bit more context, as of course, this is not a new speech to you, uh, and you've been working together. So maybe you could elaborate a little bit on the speech, what it means to you, and about the work you've been doing together. Yeah, so um, I, I knew um, Kaisara some, perhaps now half a year ago, uh, when we were starting to work properly on the Antigone in the Amazon, a kind of uh, adaptation of the of the tragedy of Sophocles today in the north of Brazil. So where you could say the capitalist system um, has uh, its clash with the indigenous cultures. And uh, for me, it was very important to have in the role of Antigone, who is kind of a resistance fighter, against Creon, uh, as she said in, in her speech, uh, somebody who is an activist, an indigenous activist. And then uh, I, I, I knew her like this. We were starting to work in November together with the Landless Movement, a very big social movement in, uh, in, uh, in Brazil, two million families occupying land to give land to the people, uh, out cutting it out of the big monocultures and uh, and so on. So a, a clash uh, with, of course, the, the government Bolsonaro. And we wanted to kind of bring all this uh, together. Uh, it would have premiered uh, a month ago now, or three weeks ago now, on the block Transamazonica. We wanted to occupy the street. The choir would have built from uh, people from this landless movement, and she would have played uh, the Antigone. But it came uh, differently. Some weeks ago, we came back uh, to Europe. She went uh, to her people into the north, in the very north uh, of, of Brazil. And, um, but we wanted to do an opening of the, of the, of the Wiener Festwochen. And then what we did, normally uh, we write in dialogue. Always when I'm, I'm doing plays, I'm, I'm kind of rehearsing and mostly listening uh, in a way and then trying to, to evaluate how we could uh, find a speech that is kind of uh, universal, who could express more than only the situation we are in, but perhaps the political situation, and uh, asked her to 
propose a speech like this, and then we sent it back and forth. And uh, that was the outcome. Actually, today, I, in the retranslation, I found out what, what we actually uh, then said in the end. Uh, I knew it more or less. What is in the newspapers is even, uh, and in different newspapers, I would say there are different versions of the speech um, because there are different perspectives you can you can you can have on it but mainly i would say it's really a wake up call to say we have to act now and if we don't do it uh, we will lose the amazon so that's that's kind of i think the message of this uh, of this whole speech so it's a call to resistance right yes maybe this is also what we could uh, speak on further it's really a pity that tanya is not because she was with us just before but it seems that she's really um, out of contact we cannot even i think send her a message on the moment so let's just continue with the two of us um if it comes to uh resistance that she really asks us um to resist she says uh because when lawlessness becomes law resistance becomes duty in her speech. Uh, I wonder what resistance uh, means to you or how you are uh, giving form to resistance through your work. Yeah, I, I think in very different ways. I mean, the, 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 the quote you, you made is for me a very important quote that I think resistance is law, is based on law and is based on justice, but sometimes justice and law are not the same, you know, in, uh, in modern societies. So for example, uh, to take another project, we did the, this uh, new version of the gospel together with, with refugees and immigrants in South Italy. Of course, they are laws to regularize them, etc. but they are not adopted, these laws, they are existing. And the same, there is a agricultural law in Brazil to give land to the people but it is not adopted because of the agribusiness. So, you know, and that's why movements like landless movements, they want to install the law. So they are not criminal. It's the government that is criminal. And I think this is a quite interesting uh, perspective you can have on civil action that you say, you came, as Jesus says in the new gospel, you came to install the law and you don't break the law. So I think it's a very different concept from the bourgeois concept, which is kind of, resistance is criminal, etc, etc, etc. I don't think so. I think the economic laws we are living in are sometimes, not always, but sometimes criminal. And of course, there is a lot of ways to do so. You can give space, like perhaps when Tanya will join, you can give space to voices, to knowledge that is just not allowed uh, in our media. The, for example, printing this, this speech is just important because I think most of the people just doesn't know what happens in north of Brazil. I remember the, speech, uh, the discussions we had to prepare here. Uh, and that's one idea of the, of the School of Resistance uh, too, to bring voices together we don't, we don't know, you know? And then you find out other perspectives on, for example, the corona crisis that you wouldn't have had before. I think the next step, of course, is, is direct action, is to occupy or to produce new myths, for example, an indigenous um, Antigone or an indigenous activist on stage uh, at the book theater. So this is kind of another way we can do as 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 artists. But now I see uh, Tanya is finally joining us. Yes, it is great. great. Yeah. Tanya, can you hear us? Yeah. Okay, we can also hear you. That's great. I'm so happy that you can join us. Um, I already introduced you, I already introduced this conversation and I asked me you know, a first question, which was actually a first response to the speech. So this would also be what I would like to ask you. What is, what are your thoughts when hearing this? And specifically, we were just talking about this moment when she says, uh, when, law, when lawlessness becomes law, resistance becomes duty. Uh, wondering what resistance means in both of your works. Okay. Let me ask you a question. One second. Hello? Yes. Hello. Yeah, we hear you. Yes, hi, hi. Yeah, yeah. Are we testing or are we live? We are live. We are, we are, we are live. live. Yeah, we were waiting for you. <laughs> one second. I had a you talk very well. One o'clock. One second. One second. Perhaps we can edit. It was really difficult to bring her in. We tried with Zoom, yeah. we tried with even yeah, another yeah. program. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm back. Yeah, can you tell me again? No problem. So, yes, we already started and I already introduced this conversation and I've introduced you both. And I asked 
uh, for kind of a general response to the speech of Kay Sarah that you've just been listening to. So I would be interested to hear your thoughts. And specifically, we were also reflecting upon this moment where she says that uh, when lawlessness becomes law, resistance becomes duty. And so I would be interested mm -hmm. to hear, and Mila was already responding with like what resistance means for you. Mm -hmm. in your work. Well, resistance is to understand pain for me because um, it is it is um, it is quite hard because you lose a lot when you resist you lose a lot but the pain that injustice I mean I always say that injustice is a is a body it's a feeling that you you have in your body you know it's something that is real and that is uh, um, not completely let's say um, uh, theoretical, you know, it's something that you feel with your body. And we know by now that a lot of laws are made to not to create justice or balance, but they are created precisely to protect a group of people in society. Yeah. And that's when the lawlessness come in because the law is supposed to be for everybody, not for a group of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, absolutely, yeah. yeah. But this is painful, resistance is painful because you have, uh, the times of politics are very long and the time of life are very short. Mm -hmm. And many times you resist and you feel that nothing is being accomplished and you have to keep going. So it is, it is a very specific exercise that one has to do as an activist to understand even if you don't see anything moving that you have to keep going you know thanks for that i think it would be interesting to hear more about um how you for example in your work try to apply or to break open the law and make sure that this is let's say a more egalitarian principle or it becomes something that can protect a group of people instead of uh, or let's say everyone instead of a group of people mm. But maybe before we enter more into contact, uh, content, it would be interesting to hear a little bit uh, for our context, because of course, um, School of Resistance uh, is born in a moment of crisis, which is this COVID-19 crisis. And, and I think it's, I mean, we tend to say we're all in it together and we're all, we're all together, but I'm, I'm afraid this is not the case and we're quite, there are quite some differences. Um, mm. So it would be interesting to hear a little bit from both of you what this crisis looks like in Cuba, in Germany, in Belgium, and uh, the situation is. I, I think we are in a double crisis because we are in the crisis of totalitarianism that we were already living before the COVID. And we are in the crisis of uh, this huge pandemia, you know, global pandemia. And, uh, and uh, yeah, both are related because um, this pandemia can be, I see it as a way to reset everything, you know, as a way to not wait anymore for doing certain things and to decide to not wait and just try to change things that don't work. And I also feel that we have been operated for too long with uh, a set of ethical paradigms that were not working for majority of people. And they were abusive, actually. They were pretending to be ethical paradigms and they were actually unethical. And um, so in this case here, I think here it has been okay the way they control the virus because they have a huge control over the population. So people who have more, the more control the government has over the population, the best the response have been in many places because they know exactly where everybody lives, who they connect with, etc. Uh, so in that sense, it has been good because uh, they immediately have found people and, you know, and it's quite controllable. The problem is that um, we had this new law, 370, which is not new, it's for a few day, years ago, but they're using it now, where whenever you put something on the internet they don't like, the government doesn't like, then they, they go against you. Mm -hmm. Either to put you a super high fine that is quite impossible to pay for majority of people, or even imprisonment. 
and this is an interesting tension because also we are living in a moment where where uh, governments want to show their best image, no? Except Trump, which he is out of this world and he doesn't care about anything. But most uh, governments want to show how good they were and how effective they were. And anything that goes against that is punished here. So that's, that's an interesting uh, tension that we have because through Facebook and internet, people have been more and more open about the reality, no? And it doesn't coincide with the propaganda, basically. Yeah. So they, the people are pushing the government to say things on the, on TV and stuff that before that never happened. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So in a way, you're saying that through this crisis, because the digital became the digital real and became so much more dominant, uh, in a way, public conversation. It's interesting because I think. From the point of view of Europe, it's it's the other way around. Like I feel, a lot of debates are not happening because we are confined in our homes. Uh, I think that in 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 your case, it's the other way around. In a way, uh, some sort of publicness of of public discussion has been possible due actually to a uh, dominance of, of digital use. But on the same time, you're also making clear that this is quite a vulnerable situation. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Milo, could you share a bit how have you been looking at uh, what's happening in Germany, Belgium, Europe, if it comes to this crisis? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite interesting what, 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 uh, what Tanya is saying, because, of course, what the crisis is doing at the one at the, at the first moment, it's quite of a stop of the whole machine and it's quite of an opening of the, of the historic situation and you have the impression everything can change. For example, it was interesting to see how collective action and what you know, so the knowledge of scientists, how it can link, be linked immediately, you know, how disciplined so a civic society can be and how collectively we can act, if it's a good action or not, but just this link for me was extremely interesting sociologically. On the other hand, what uh, a crisis shows, and I think, of course, we are not living in a totalitarian system like, like Tanya's, but mm -hmm. you see that normality even becomes more normal and the whole system tries to establish itself and to go back where they were before, even more normalized uh, than before. And that's, I think, the moment we are in now, when we are going back to normality and everybody understands oh wow, neoliberalism will even be stronger. We left some people behind. It will be even a bigger struggle of everybody against everybody. And you really understand that if you don't change the system, for example, only in the cultural sector, if you don't mm -hmm. uh, make a separation in between capital and art, for example, by a basic income, it will just continue. Mm -hmm. You have to go back to the ways of producing as before, because work and art and capital is linked. So we understand that systematically we change now or it's too late because the machine will even get later because we have to run behind what we lost in the last month, you know? So now I, I, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a director of a theater, I see how we try to do even more projects. I mean, this was the first motivation to do even more in the season because you have to bring now everything because everybody who is relying on you on the institution he needs it and so you are kind of trapped in the whole in the whole system and that's really like kind of how can we wake up out of this dream and everybody takes his position for example it was so interesting to see the intellectuals when she's saying uh, you should now shut up and listen what Europe was doing, like inter giving the interpretation, or let's say that the, the North giving the interpretation of everything, even before it happened. Slavoj Žižek produced his book, <laughs> I think even before uh, COVID-19 appeared, the book was finished. So before yeah. the whole dream, the night is over, the analysis of the dream and what we have to think about it and what we will do when we wake up was mm. already made. And sometimes I think just lie a bit back think about it and listen, for example, to Tanya or listen to, to Kaisara and to, to understand what globally is happening. There is also this anxiety as you, as, as you are signaling, no? the anxiety of being present. I think capitalism brings this 
um, anxiety of doing, 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 being, being, being yeah. present all the time. That now, instead of people, for example, I've been for two months completely disconnected from the world. This is the first thing I do online um, because I was enjoying. <laughs> no, I was enjoying being on my own in, with my thoughts, with my friend, recuperating the emotional world that we're losing because capitalism is so fast so brutal that you're losing the humanity of it you know and it was beautiful to again engage with your plants with your family with you know what i mean and unfortunately the problem is that when we are in a crisis everybody reacts and do the right thing as soon as the crisis finish what happens is people forget we were in crisis and then go back to the same old same old exploitation abuse uh, uh, you know fakeness and uh, so that's the problem I, I am not so excited like I was talking to a friend the other day like oh after these people are going to change I'm not so sure because people forget you know but that's interesting that's interesting what you say because it's a kind of a feeling that was my feeling too it's kind of a disintegration you have the impression <laughs> you are not linked anymore to to anybody and for example this myth or I mean it's a reality of not contacted people in the Amazon and they don't want to be contacted because they don't yeah. know that what there's something outside and that there is still places in the world that are really functioning as a kind of a confinement an eternal confinement and you shouldn't break it up you know do not be contacted do not be present you know and as yeah. you say you forget this so fast how it is to for example make plans or writing down place you will perhaps never stage but you do it just as a as a for the script for the fun yeah yeah i think people have lost the joy of living you know before this lost the joy and this is kind of giving you okay go and look at the details of the little things i make and also uh, somehow this kind of global thing is like everybody should have the same rules should want the same clothes should want the same goal in the life and no as you say there are other people who go with other rules and this is fa fantastic. I hope we have more of that before, after this, you know. And the, the problem, I think, is a structural. I think I'm glad that we talk about the laws because I think it's a structural. Uh, we need to do a structural change in the world. We cannot complain anymore. I mean, I'm, I'm tired of complaining. I think we need to build up. And I always say doing art for the not yet, meaning doing art for the society you want, not the one you have, but they start already behaving for the moments and the society and the ethics that you want to live in. Because, yeah, you might not change the whole world. It's impossible. But at least you can change the way you are interacting with that world, you know. So I don't want to wait anymore. I think we need to start behaving That's as we want everybody to behave. I'm very uh, ready for that, Tanya, and I think it would be very good to, to continue that uh, stream of thought. But maybe before we go into uh, let's act upon the not yet, but um, on the conditions we would like to have uh, or to see in the world. Um, I think what you're both describing, this uh, thing of, at the one hand, um, kind of enjoying or reconnecting to, let's say, being local, and maybe also indeed stop being visible, presenting, um, having this image of, of success, being part of this production machine, but in a way slow down, that this is something that we embrace. And at the same time, I hear you both saying, well, there's not so much time to wait. Uh, we should act now. And, and I think it is a conflict that I hear for, with a lot of people. And I wonder how you are both dealing with that. Um, can we slow down? Uh, or is this actually very risky because maybe the system doesn't slow down and is ready to uh, pop up whenever it can? Yeah, I mean, one one possible answer to it to this is I think there are two there are two lines of it. There is of course the structural line that there is a system being in the upcoming again, and you can't kind of just slow down because then you are left behind. And that's what, what is happening now at the very moment. So you can't slow it down. I think we have really structurally work on the institutions. And that's why I think it's important to invade institutions and to change institutions and perhaps to create new institutions, symbolic institutions of the future. That you would say, mm -hmm. okay, let's create the institution in which we can work 
by then changing the whole system, how we want to work to create the future we want to have. How can we use, for example, a city theater or only a little project in a way that it makes sense as an institute of change. So that's why we, exactly. we, we try to work in ways which it seems very difficult. And I, find, I, I have the impression I found out a lot about connecting in the last weeks, we, uh, for example, globally, that I went back on, on, on the books I had. I was perhaps very different from, from Tanya. I was in many, many uh, live streams <laughs> and discussions. <laughs> and I was extremely happy, for example, to see how unimportant it is the image you have, because we have now three shitty images. We are talking together <laughs> in different in different places of the world. It's all mixed together in New York to be staged in in Vienna, you know. And then uh, Kaisara sends us a video that she made somehow with her iPhone uh, this morning, and we like kind of subtitled it. And it's not like the big thing in the Burgtheater and thousand people, and she flies in and she does it, etc. Mm. No, it's it's a it's a it's a different way of uh, of working together. And I think this mm -hmm. is really really important to find out this. But on the other hand, to 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 end with, uh, for me, uh, there is really big structural change that has to be done. And I'm always coming back on the on the on the on the on the general basic income that mm -hmm. as long we are depending from producing, presenting, showing, being present, and if we are not, uh, we will lose everything. We can't pay our bills. So how could we ever disconnect if we don't create mm. a parallel system in which we can we can kind of produce in another way? Mm, absolutely. No, I, I think there are different. I mean, I, I totally agree with you. And, and there are different aspects. One is the loss, because we need the change to be in place for a long time. The second one is institutions, because these are the people who implement that the, the culture of the law, let's say, of how we interact with each other or can propose an alternative. But then we have to also create an education, like an emotional, an ethical and civic education for people because people are also part of this i mean the laws and the system is not something alien it's part of what we are being living and it has changed all of us you know it has put this anxiety on us it has put these desires on us that are not interesting or important so i think we also need to create a long-term process where we uh deal with emotional culture as well, this is for, and another thing that you were talking is, is interesting because yes, now we're doing all of this immediacy, which I think is, is an interesting way to substitute the touch. Immediacy has substitute touching somebody, you know, in a way. But, uh, but at the same time, I wonder if we could slow down, but not slow down in the sense like those, but just to make sure that you take the time things are needed because, the other thing I'm nervous is about we live before in this kind of world where, where celebrity and uh, all of these was substituting art. You know? People wanted to be famous, not to do an artwork that lasted for 300 years. You know what I mean? In terms mm -hmm. of what gives to be. So I think this is an interesting, uh, that's what I'm saying about slow as well, uh, because I'm also wondering about the quality uh, of in the future of art. If we keep with this quick, uh, you know, you know what I mean. Like when you read Goethe, you have something that was said, I don't know, hundreds of years before, but you still feel about it. How can we keep this, the feel of art, and the feel of justice beyond the immediacy? I don't know. I don't have any answer. I'm just uh, asking this question that I'm asking myself now. No. Because uh, yeah, if you have seven zooms a week. No, or whatever, like how we keep um, the stimulation, but also the depth, no? Because there is a balance between being a stimulating and also to have depth in your thoughts, no? And, uh, and also time to implement. I were talking about production. I like to use the word implementation, actually, because when I use, it might be a different way you and Piatto use production, but uh, for visual arts, production is more about making things happen, no? Whether for me, implementation is a process where you bring the people for whom the work is 
as part of the process of, of creating something, no? And I think this is also for me part of what I would like to see after this time of COVID, you know? That people are also taken in consideration in a different way, not only as a spectator or participants, but also as implementers, you know, the people who will implement something in their space, in their life. And also, I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting. You think. Um, you've been talking before, Tanya, also in, in, in interviews, and I've heard you saying it also in the beginning, like the importance of emotions or the importance of effect and that we're emo emotional beings. <laughs> and I think yeah. you're both actually artists, uh, you and Milo, that work a lot with that uh, and, and try to, let's say, go beyond, I don't know, a very um, experimental uh, work that's only for a, a group of, of insiders or a very intellectual, but that, that you are looking and that art maybe, this is maybe also a question, is actually a way for a language that could potentially reach a, a lot more people. Um, Absolutely. I have a yeah. I have a concept I use for my work. Sometimes I have to create concept because I don't feel I can explain myself well, so I use this as a device. And the concept is in Spanish because sometimes Spanish is better than English. Uh, is richer. Is estética is the word for aesthetics. But in Spanish, if you divide the word in two, is est, which in, in Latin means the verb to be. It is and ethics, which I love because for me, the idea of aesthetic as the appreciation and development of the transformation through ethics is fascinating. And it's something I'm very interested at, not seeing only aesthetic as how you best do something uh, formally, etc., but also how can you, through this experiment, this emotional moment, etc., generate a new aesthetical re ethical realm, ethical paradigm. And that's yeah. the beauty of it, no? So where as aesthetics and ethics actually become, in a way, the, the two, two sides of the same coin, right? And they are always in relation to each other. Uh, I wanted actually to jump to something okay, Sarah said, but now that we're here, maybe it's interesting to both hear um, your response on um, the work of Schlingensief. Uh, yes. Yeah. Can I can I just like interfere a second because uh, I see that people is asking why Kaisara is not here as uh, as part of discussions and sometimes and I think it's interesting uh, just to know that it is impossible uh, because she sent us this video it takes uh, eight hours to only upload a ten minutes video she's in the middle of the Amazon and it's really kind of it was crazy to only get this this speech made and sent to uh, to us. So it's, it's completely uh, impossible that mm -hmm. she's with us. I hope soon uh, she will. Yes, thanks for saying that, Mio, it's true. I didn't saw it in the, in the chat immediately, or I didn't got that this is actually a question already uh, coming from the audience. And it's, of course, a very understandable one because yeah. of course, it's one of the voices that we would really like to hear uh, more. Uh, but I think you contextualize very well why we're... And I mean, I think one of the questions that we are also, I'd like to, to pose to you both, it has to do, of course, with this uh, possibility of international uh, collaboration uh, and on the same time, of course, feeling very much constrained. So the international exchange is under attack, we could say. Um, it, it, it wasn't for capital, it wasn't for goods. Um, it is now for people. It has always been for certain people and not for others. And the question is, of course, what kind of future we will go to uh, if it comes to that. And I guess, um, I don't know, Milo, you sounded quite positive. You were saying like, I, I, I like this idea of being um, connected to all these people in different ways, uh, which yeah, seems like you are actually embracing this digital realm as something that might be a progressive tool. Whereas of course, uh, we could also have questions or doubts about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, theater is an extremely practical work. It's a collective work. You have to, actually you kind of live together for weeks and for months and that's how a play is constructed it's not that somebody has an idea or a text you can do theater like this but i i i don't and uh, it's something that is developing and even i mean i i have perhaps to add a, a little pessimistic uh, uh mm -hmm. moments to it it was very difficult and for me even a bit disappointing to do the speech together with uh, Kaysara like this 
that you send something, mm -hmm. somebody sends back, it takes six hours, it takes eight hours. Then you find the chat, you can like talk for three minutes, it's over. You don't reach each other anymore. There are misunderstandings. But what I found out, and it was quite interesting, by sending these texts uh, to Amazonia and back to here and, and check it together, there were big misunderstandings. We weren't mm -hmm. understanding each other. And then we started by listening to trying to understand, to make an interpretation. Perhaps it was just like lost in translation. And this was a very interesting uh, process by being disconnected. So that's for me one interesting point, but it's a small thing. The other thing is that it's the first time I meet Tanya now <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> in life, but we, 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 we kind of reflected a lot, one on the work of the other and etc. And even, I mean, the speech was called Against Integration. Tanya was uh, uh, preparing a, a school of integration. So we were on the same topics, but we never met because actually, uh, this kind of, of possibility to be connected like this, to have a school of resistance, a debate mm -hmm. uh, like this was even not for me. I didn't do it. I just like, I can't go to Vienna. I can't go there, so we will not meet. So I just mm -hmm. didn't do it. And then we were planning to do this school of resistance like next year, we're flying in a lot of people and we found out it's faster, it's more simple, it's more convenient. And it's kind of more, I don't know, there's more outcome if we do it like this. So this is a kind of ecological, a... Ecological, you Milo, know, is quite important here. I guess you should have named this the first one. It's more ecological. And it's much more, of course, it's much more, it's, it's, yeah, it's ecological, of course. Uh, the but... problem is that <laughs> the theater is an is a, is a art of presence. So exactly. one time we have to meet again, me and Kaysara, or there will be no Antigone and Amazon. And she has to be on stage, and we have to be on the in the same space somehow, you know. Mm. Tanya? Yeah, I think no. I I am very. Uh, it's very. Um, it kind of goes well with my plans because I was super tired of traveling, and I actually had this decide to not travel after after this uh, festival in Vienna for six months because I was really. I think it was not healthy for me, this one day here, one day there, what are you giving people? Or what is the quality of the energy you're giving to people, no? And, uh, but at the same time, I think this is a very good advice. It helps a lot and more people can be, and now this where you, many people can see what is happening is fantastic. But I have to say that when I have been in events, the moments that are more productive for me is when you may be sitting down you, Milo, me, you, uh, and uh, having a beer where there is no pressure to be smart, or precise, or, or, or nice, or whatever. And all of a sudden, you start saying whatever, and something amazing comes up. We have to see how can we do that in this format as well. Because this format is really effective, it's really good. At many levels, it's ecological, it's... It's more healthy for people to be in their house and just having, but it would be nice to to create this, a way in which we can be loose and this kind of accidents or, or join us happens between people. Because every time I have one of these, it's very, you know, it's like a meeting, you know? No, and I think this, this connects again to this idea of slowing down in the sense of like, mm, creating conditions in which something can happen that we couldn't predict uh, yet. Whereas here, I think we're all performing right now and we want to be to the point and we know we have listeners, etc. Whereas sometimes mm -hmm. maybe the new ideas or the alternative or what hasn't been articulated yet can only come from a slower way of being together. And I guess one of my big questions is how this slowing down can be strong enough against a system that doesn't slow down uh, on the contrary. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit conflicted because there's a question uh, from the audience that is very interesting, but quite specific there. We were st still talking about um, ethics and aesthetics, uh, and I wanted to make a bridge to Slingensee. And also this question about why Kaysara is not part of the discussions uh, stays a bit with me. And I, I, I wonder maybe also for listeners, so I wonder maybe if we start with that. I mean, there's a clear demand of... Okay, Sarah and her speech to stop talking and listen. She really asks us to listen and still we're here talking. And I guess you're both also 
seen as very important political artist of these times. You get a lot of invitations. Um, Tanya was sharing how much he's traveling. I know a bit how much you're traveling, Milo, as well. Like, how are you, and maybe this also connects a little bit to the question that uh, is asked and uh, that I will share with you in a bit. Um, how are you using this power or these platforms to speak uh, in order for actually to listen in a way, or maybe amplify voices of other people? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it would be interesting, perhaps also a bit kind of a parallel uh, experience of, of, of Tanya and me um, is that as a, as, a, as a director, of course, you are somebody as a theater director, especially as somebody that constructs platforms where things can happen and stories are told. And for example, I never wrote a book about myself because I'm talking through others, through projects, you know, and uh, through symbolic rooms, institutions that can be plays, can be an adaptation, can be a, a tribunal like the Congo Tribunal, can be part of a, a Bible film, it can be this, this kind of, uh, of school of resistance, because this is the first, let's say, chapter opening of, of Vino Festival at the same time. In the later uh, sessions, I will not be present. Perhaps I will host one of the sessions or even not. Because it's, I think it's important to invite, of course, perspectives that are not present all the time in this kind of, of, of discussions. And I think everybody who is connected here more or less knows what I am, uh, I am saying normally. So I think this is one role, of course, we have to be kind of a loudspeaker, somebody who con can construct uh, platforms, especially in that time. Because when I read this, uh, you should shut up uh, and you should listen. Uh, and at the same time, I had read this Slavoj Žižek's book in my hand. Uh, I was thinking of, I mean, we are talking mm -hmm. all the time, explaining all the time, and uh, it's too much. It's too much. It's time to wait and to see what happens and try to connect. And I think for me, that's now the, the thing to do, to connect knowledge, to connect ways mm -hmm. of practice, to find spaces where you can do this. Because the problem of theater is that, uh, I don't know, we call a collective when people that knew each other in school, in art school, are doing then plays together. We call this a collective. But it's not a collective. It's just a repetition of the same milieu, you know? And I think we have to find places where we bring people together um, um, that would never think together. And then there is more than listening and talking, there is a dialogue. And out of this dialogue comes something that nobody knew before. And this is my, this is my dream of the, of the art of mm -hmm. now and, and, and the future. <laughs> oh, pretty cool. Well, I think in, in my case, um, uh, the way I do it is I, I am very aware of power dynamics sometimes when they exist and I try what I'm trying to do with my work is opening spaces you know like you too you know like going to a place trying to open spaces pushing boundaries uh, meaning that I would take the risk and then as soon as these boundaries are being pushed and the space is open then I invite others to come because I think in my case I work with immigration immig immigrants or with vulnerable populations or with activists maybe in Cuba who are not so well known and I think it's important that people like us who have some power or some visibility take the risk you know the personal risk the human risk the body risk all the risk political risk mm -hmm. but not because we are the one talking for others it's because we are the ones who, even if we lost power, if we lost privilege, we still have some. Yeah, so yeah. we can actually give it away in order for things to happen. But as soon as we have that, we need to withdraw. That's what I do. As soon as this is up, I withdraw and let other people go in. Because I think the what we can do as political artists is not only uh, do public reflections, uh, um, I don't know, incitate people to, to protest or whatever with our work, but also to create, as you say, platform where other people can stand up. And not, be, and not because of you, just because of them. They have the need and the right to have it. So I think in this case for me, is, is a, that's why I work so much with institutions that I create because it's a framework people understand. 
You know, when you work with an institution that you create, even if it's fake or it's temporary, people understand that it's a platform, you know? For example, the Migrant Movement International that you started, maybe exactly. I that's for everyone that's a known project. But uh, oh, the, oh, now in Cuba, for example, have the Institute of Art and Activism, Anna Arendt, which is called the, the small name is INSTAR, which is the verb in Spanish that means to, to invite people, to push people to do something. You know, so this is something that we are creating here that has been amazing and uh, is opening up, you know. And also the thing is, for us, we can try and fail. All the people do not have the privilege to fail. So they need a spaces where they can fail together mm -hmm. and it's fine, you know? Um, maybe uh, to go quickly to a question because I have uh, a series of questions I want to continue, but maybe to give uh, the floor to someone uh, from the audience, someone who's um, following us. So someone would like to know a little bit more, uh, Tanya, about your statement that laws should protect everyone instead of a small group. Um, Can you say it again? What, what statement? Your statement that laws should protect everyone instead of a specific group. And she agrees that laws are there to prevent injustice, uh, but she wonders what we do with laws that are precisely there actually to protect minorities. Mm -hmm. What do we do with those laws for protect minority? I mean, yeah, of course, we, we don't have uh, the person here, but this is what I presume, like, are you feeling that those laws are not there or they're there enough or like how are we they're not enough they're not enough of those laws but the other thing is we have to understand that the law is always coming after the fact so laws are always uh, a posteriori you know like they come after the dilemma has been solved by society when that's mostly no where everybody has agreed on something, no? And I feel that the law should be used in other ways, in the way to educate people, instead of the law to repress and to, and to force you to be morally some way. Because for me, the problem with the law is many times it relates to morals instead of ethics, no? And then I feel like it would be better if we start doing laws that prevent things, that educate with the, the, um, the existence of the law instead of um, punishing you uh, because already everybody agreed that this is wrong or right, you know? And, and this is a big dilemma, the, the non-synchronicity of the law with reality. Uh, interesting. No. You're almost pr proposing like a priori, like 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 laws that being developed before uh, the damage is done in a way. There is there is a system that I use for my work in Arte Util and Useful Art, which is, and a lot of my friends, we deal with this, the activists. In Spanish, it's called a legal. In English, you don't have it. A legal is a concept no, of the perfect. law. Yeah. Yeah. You have it? You have it in German? No, 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 but I imagine it's kind of parallel to the law. It's kind yeah. of... A, yeah, so precisely, a legal is when you behave in a way that the law has not yet codified. So mm -hmm. it's not illegal because the law did not um, have this image, uh, social image, but you are doing it. So it is, I love it because it's, it's beyond the law. So it's something that you feel is right. It's not illegal because they haven't considered this yet, to regulate this yet, but you feel it's the right ethical way to behave. So I think that's a way that I answer to this because the laws are very slow. They, unfortunately, at least in the United States, I don't know, Europe, you pay to have your laws, which I think is immoral and horrible. The people who have um, the money and the and the you know and the lobby people is the one who get the laws not it has nothing to do with with the justice or with ethics or with the sense of an image of who we are as a society no? so i think let's start doing illegal actions yeah, acting so as we think yeah exactly so it's again existing laws and this is, is are more protecting the system the system that benefits the few and not everyone and I think you both are working a lot with this idea of institutions. Milo, you made several laws, yeah. trial projects uh, where you're also, in a way, pre-enacting trials uh, that 
are not happening in reality yet, but should and can already happen through art. And then maybe in that way, let's say, goes over I, reality. You know, I, uh, yeah, please. I'm sorry, uh, well, let me, let me say, uh, I think it's important to do things illegal and not illegal, because when you do something illegal, you give all the power to that law and to that government. So I think this, this is, is why creativity, yeah. This is, this is absolutely the point, especially when you work, I guess, uh, Tanya in Cuba, but also when you work in Amazonia, when you work, for example, the landless movement, the occupation they do are completely not illegal. The monocultures are mm -hmm. illegal, or the land is divided illegally against the constitution of Brazil. And we have, of course, the, mm -hmm. for example, the law and the constitution, the article that you can occupy land if this land is illegally in the hands of somebody. We have in the German constitution, we have in the Italian constitution. And that's why that's when amazing. we, for me, it's kind of, there's this quote when we did the, the Jesus film last year, when Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. Because for example, it's impossible for migrants to be illegal. It's not possible in the constitution, in the European constitution, and I'm even not talking about uh, the human yeah. rights, eh? because this is perhaps only bourgeois morality, but I'm talking about the constitution of every nation and the whole European Union. And it's not possible that somebody enters Europe and is illegal. This is an invention. Of it's course. criminal. To and all of these are inventions. These are all inventions that are against the constitutions. And so the move we do normally with our so-called symbolic, uh, crazy, utopian institutions, we just try to use the laws we all agreed in our constitution. Exactly. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, that's a kind of sad also in a way that we like to attribute utopian thinking to us, but in a way we're just following, I mean, agreements it has made treaties that have been made uh, years and years ago that we seem not to be able to to follow. Um, there's another question or two questions here. Uh, the first one, I'm not sure I completely, so let's try to figure it out together. So someone says um, that she wonders what Tanya and Milo said is to overcome learned helplessness that man has learned under the systematic control until now. Yeah, yeah. I'm not entirely sure what this uh, question. I, 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 I agree. I, agree. Yeah. I would do a very fast uh, yeah. interpretation of it because I think this is really, this is for me crucial that you live in a system and you have the impression it has to go like this and it's kind of the structure and it works like this. That's how I was educated and that's why it's important what Tanya says. We need another education where you understand that what you live is by historical accident normalized. And you are, not exactly. complete, you are completely not helpless. Everything, every institution we are living in at one moment was established as the outcome of a political or social struggle. And <laughs> by, by political mm. or social struggle. And that's for me the, 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 the why uh, I, I thought perhaps we will also talk about the, 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 the let's say the method or the, the, the framework of integration. Mm. Because, uh, of course, normalization tries to integrate everything, that there is no illegality, there is no space, you know, mm -hmm. no space outside. Everything is took into the structure, is normalized. And uh, I'm, I'm going that, to... Yeah? Mm -hmm. No, I'm go for it. Say, because the strange yeah, thing is that when you are in this big, uh, helpless dream of, of capitalism, you understand that, for example, the slaves, they don't mm -hmm. want to abolish slavery, they want to become masters, you know? It's a kind of, a, from all perspective, you have this yeah. helplessness. And that's the big problem. And I think the big chance when for one moment it stops and you see, ah, we can just say we don't continue. Ah, okay, it's possible. No, I think I'm glad that you talk about this because uh, when I put the title School of Integration, it was ironic. Mm -hmm. But I remind, when they told me that you were doing this School of Resistance and the, the other project about non-integration and stuff like that, I loved it because you were criticizing my project in a way. And I loved it because you reminded me that sometime in politics, you can be ironic. Mm -hmm. You know, you sometime when you're dealing, you cannot be ironic. No, no, Because it's, it's then you get terrible. lost in the irony. You know, because irony is very easy to manipulate by people who don't want to do the stuff, you know. So I think it's, uh, I actually thank you for that. 
because you were giving me. Yeah. Or to, maybe just to contextualize for some people. So, so Tanya, you were uh, going to start a school for integration, which would be more than 60 classes mediated and teached by migrant communities yeah. in Vienna. This would be, have been part of the Wiener Festwoche and the speech that... Um, there, were classes, there were classes by the immigrants to the Viennese, right. to the locals, okay. That's important. to learn about other places no to, to exactly. but it's interesting because in the discussion with the activists that were working in collaboration for this project we had many meetings because they didn't like integration also mm -hmm. so it's maybe before you tell little more about that um and milo um speech or, or text that he wrote together with k sarah was actually under the title against integration which is also the title for the next season of uh, and against that, that feeling so in a way we have an interesting uh, uh opposite here of uh, against integration school for integration what why were um the people not happy with this integration terminology tanya because the same reason you're talking about because the same reasons uh milo is giving because they they were um they, there is a pro it's a problematic concept it's a very problematic concept because also integration usually is seen as the person who arrives lose his own identity to become part of what is there you know so i think there is this uh force erasure cultural erasure um that is quite brutal to be honest and and not natural you know so i think they were against that uh very much so so if you would do so i can go back to them now <laughs> i mean what is interesting what was interesting, of course, is that you shifted it around. So it's the school of integration for the Viennese people that supposed to be inter integrated already. So interestingly enough, no, like but they're supposed to be they're supposed to be integrated with the people who arrive, because the problem is yes, it's, it's okay to learn German, okay, that's fine, but also they should they should learn Swahili as well. Exactly. The Viennese should learn Swahili, you know, or Arabic or whatever, you know. I mean, maybe integration so, would not be such a problem if this would be equal, yeah. but it's always, of course, in opposition to a dominant yeah. culture. Or no, so and it, also, and also the fact that for me there is a problem uh, everywhere I've been uh, with the perception of immigrants. Immigrants are always welcomed as long as they entertain or they serve, or they dance, make music, or or are they happy, you know, party, or they're cooking for you, they are sewing your clothes. Yeah, this kind so of that's the problem. concept, no? Yeah. Yeah, so and then there is they, a kind everybody of, is dancing, yeah. Yeah, and also it seems like it's still a kind of a slave uh, dynamic where you are serving me, you know? And, and what about all the knowledge these people come with? What about, I always say that we create a factory of uh, garbage knowledge because all these people come with amazing knowledge and you know this very well Milo because you've been traveling and talking to all these people have an amazing political uh, education amazing emotional education and all of this is erased because they're only here to serve us you know to do the job you don't want or the or the you know or entertain I mean, you you know I think that uh, saying we're in a crisis now in a way feels all the time problematic also to me because I have constantly this feeling like we were already in a crisis, but we just called it normality, which was maybe the, the, the real crisis. Uh, and the question, and I'm thinking about this because I think in the, in the case of migrants, this huge, huge fundamental inequality becomes very clear. Um, there, there's a response from, from the audience and a question um, where uh, someone would like to hear your thoughts um, as Kay Sarah is talking about resistance and about the 10 years that are left before the planet lungs die, uh, shouldn't we not be in the streets instead of the theater? Uh, which connects a little bit to another question about art, um, uh, let's say post-COVID art. I mean, what can art be or mean uh, in, 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 in a world, a post-COVID-19 world or maybe a world where pandemics will um, stay? Uh, what is what is the role of art? I mean, you've been already talking a little bit about this ethics, aesthetics, but maybe this specific uh, remark about uh, shouldn't we not be in the streets? I, I think we should have as many different kind of art as possible. I am always against any kind of uh, 
normally uh, kind of um, generalization about things and 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 this kind of fake satisfaction that because everything looks alike you think is okay i think we need to have we need, we, have, we were having a crisis before the covid with emotions because emotions were being reduced to very generic category like like don't like uh, angry happy uh, this, uh, of course, because Facebook, of course, Trump, all of these were emotion has been reduced into a kind of monolithic. Uh, uh, and I think art can be a place where people can find the complexity of emotions and the complexity of situations. And not everybody resets emotionally the same way. So why we want to have on the street or in the theater or it should be everything and as much as possible. But the most important is to make sure we also take care of artists. Mm -hmm. We pay them, we pay them, we treat them respectfully, you know. But I don't know what you... I mean, yes, just to talk, Milo, before you, sorry, just to add maybe in, in relation to the last thing Tanya is saying, of course, we have, uh, at least in Europe, this um, huge bunch of articles saying like, you know, all these art uh, institutions are, are, are um, broke and, and are uh, having a problem and they won't be able to, to exist. So people are really pleading for, for let's mm, say, more protection gotcha. of artists. And, and, and on the other hand, you could maybe ask yourself, like, it's, is it artists we should save right now? Like, yeah, is this perfect. what it's about? Milo, could you? I, I just would like to really focus on the question because she's saying, how are you dealing with the fact that this planet is dead in 10 years? <laughs> so how is the mm -hmm. reaction you have on that? And it seems, and I see that we continue talking and that's fine, uh, but I see that we are kind of, it's kind of impossible mm -hmm. to react to this. So what should mm -hmm. art do, or perhaps, I don't know, what should all representative systems do? They should, this thing that in a strange way is imaginary, externalized somewhere in Amazonia, but everything is connected, but somewhere, it's somewhere else in the future that we can touch, but it's only 10 years. And I think yeah. the work of art is to bring this in, to make it visible, to kind of educate us, to deal with it, to only feel it, you know? And I think to really understand, we are not in a dramatic situation where we can kind of change a bit mm. the institution and give perhaps uh, this or that to the artists, or I don't know what. Uh, we are in a tragic institution. We have to take some decisions. We have to bring the machine down. How can we as artists, mm. intellectuals, curators, whatever, I mean, that's our field. Mm. Huh? I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a real political activist. Huh? I'm behaving sometimes or I'm giving a platform, but I'm somebody who can connect and who can represent and that's what I know to do. And for me, the big work of the next 10 years and of tomorrow and of now, and perhaps even of this school of mm -hmm. resistance is to make it real. <laughs> to exactly, make these yeah. things real and connect exactly. what we know and what we do because she's saying and the most horrible of crayon listening to him is he knows that he's going directly to the apocalypse and he hates himself for that but he just continues mm. you know and to yeah. change that that's for me the 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 the, the meaning of, of 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 even a discussion like this one but of course, you're both very much referring still to knowing. We have to know, we have to make this know knowledge visible. It has to be effective. So it has to touch us, emotional. And on the same time, Kay Sarah says, but actually you all know, you know already. The horrible thing is you don't, you, you're used to know it. And now- how is, how is, how is, how is, I mean, this is for me the tragic moment. How is knowledge linked to action for example when you when you when you read king oedipus so let's say the most classical mm -hmm. of all tragedies the strange thing is that from the beginning on king oedipus knows he killed his father he killed and he fucked his mother and everybody tells him that he's deeply perverse his normality is perverse <laughs> and he knows it because in the first scene the choir tells him and then a guardian arrives and tells again but he's just not able to connect to this knowledge you know and that's the whole tragic plays are just about this impossibility of connecting. And I have to say that for me, moments in theater, they are called cathartic, they are called, I don't know, you can have different terms, but how do you connect mm -hmm. emotionally and then in action to what you know, that's all what is about. For me, that's all what is about. Knowing is nothing, doing is nothing, connecting is the thing. 
Anya? No, I, I also think it's about creating art that understand the consequences and deal with the consequences, you know? Uh, art where you, the consequences is not, is not uh, something you haven't thought of, but it's part of the process of creating the work. You know what I mean? That, the, that you have responsibility over the consequence. And in that sense, um, um, it is about, I always talk about arte util or, or art that is useful or that is a tool because I almost feel, and I agree with Milo, I almost feel that now art has shown people its importance, you know, over this, this time of uh, isolation, etc. And it's important as a tool. So I also think, I also see art in the future as a tool. So it is um, done by more people, but also as a tool, you know, like it's something that will help people to overcome fear, to overcome uh, uh, the misunderstanding between each other. Um, yeah. On the same time, of course, there is this thing that you were speaking about, Tanya, as, as if time is also, let's say, not congruent, or how are we saying this, that you have the feeling that um, you can know something, but before the system starts to also act upon this, you, you said life is too short and change goes <laughs> too slow in a way. And I think this is also something I can very much uh, relate to. And it's very, I mean, this is this feeling of helplessness, right? That one of the questions was that, that, that we have the feeling that, I mean, 10 years, the green lungs, you know? So, 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 I mean, we know the climate catastrophe is already there. It's not yeah. something abstract. It's already happening. People are suffering. People are fleeing because of this. And still we don't see the system responding. Um, so how, how do we make this frustration uh, productive? Uh, I guess it's also a question. Do, do you want to still respond to, uh, on this or because we have been touching upon this, of course, else I go to another question because we also slowly uh, have to round up. Okay, no, I just very quickly, it's about interest. The problem is we have been living up to now in a world where interest trumps everything else. Trumps reality, trumps justice, trumps the truth, you know. So I think we need to, to yeah, change that. so true what you say. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's so true. I can, <laughs> I can, yeah, that's, that's could be a last sentence, but do you have one question <laughs> more? <laughs> it feels now a little bit stupid, but it was still hanging in the air. And also because this was, would have been one of the, um, the topics of the conversation at the, at the Vienna Festival. So, so, um, Schlingensee heritage and this um, Peace Law of Austria, that actually your work, School of Integration, was also using this title, uh, mm -hmm. Peace Law of Austria, School of Integration, uh, Tanya. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, like 20 years ago, looking back at this work, uh, and it's maybe important to give to contextualize a little bit for the people that don't know. So uh, Schlingensee placed a container uh, on the square in Vienna where he placed 12 asylum seekers and he played a bit with his big brother uh, genre that was then very uh, popular and, and, and upcoming where um, people in, in, uh, in Austria could vote for the one they didn't like. And then I think two people per day and this lasted uh, a week and they were filmed 24 uh, seven and, and two people per day had to uh, leave uh, which meant uh, were deported back to their country. Um, and the one that would win would get a financial prize and, and the possibility to, of, of, of um, Austrian citizenship by marrying someone. Um, I, I, I think it's interesting also in relation to ethics, aesthetics, like how do you position uh, yourself to work like this? I think this work has been often framed as one of the most political uh, works with, with a lot of impact because of, of the reactions and the fact that it became a political discussion on the square by bystanders. Um, how are you feeling about uh, the, the choices in this? Yeah. Well, no, no, okay, sorry. No, please, please, Tanya. I, I don't have so much to say about it, so it's- uh... No, 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 you go. No, please, 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 really. <laughs> okay. No, I think now he looks like a visionary, but I heard he was a pain in the ass. So I think we should be more pain in the asses as artists. <laughs> and less complacent in a way. Uh, but I feel I am, I really like his work a lot. I knew about it since 2005, five, six. 
And uh, I actually dedicate his work, the piece I did here in 2014 in the Revolution Square to him because I was using the same methodology. And I, one of the things I feel are still very current in his, what I understand about his work, I might wrong, be wrong, I'm not an expert, is the tension between reality and the construction of, uh, of an image or of a metaphor. And I like very much, especially in that piece, that you think is true, you know? The fact that you feel this is really happening to somebody is actually opening up the honesty of the reaction to people. Because, you know, in theater, but also in visual arts, people have a codified way to behave. You no, know? you have to applaud, you have to like it, don't like it. And this completely broke all the agreements you have with audiences, you know? And, and the audience transform into citizens. They're not audiences anymore. They're just citizens. They're individual people. And I think that is absolutely fascinating, mm -hmm. putting this ethical um, ethical dilemma. And at the same time, when you see the documentary, you see how much he was struggling for this to take energy and how much he actually provoked people. Because it is true, and you see the, the anxiety and the agony of the artist, because also people don't care. You know, that piece also tr shows that you have to really be extremely intense for people to care, huh? in mm -hmm. a way. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Milo. Yeah, very short. I think what for me is uh, very interesting in that that uh, that piece that became a, a classic. You would even say you learn it at art school. You watch once the container show, etc. Of course, you see how the machine starts in the beginning. How everybody thinks nothing will happen, then the media, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for me, the interesting thing is, and that's for me, performance or theater is that you representing is not interesting. A machine can represent. What is interesting that the representation itself becomes real. You know, of course, mm. everybody knows yeah. it's just made up and these are not real refugees and they will not be deported and they will not marry an Austrian mm. woman, etc., etc. But it becomes real in the reaction and in the kind mm. of taking the responsibility of even the country itself, the media, as if they would understand. But I, this is a real situation. We have to we have to say, no, 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 it's not, etc., etc. And then, as mm -hmm. you describe it from moral, you go into ethics and from kind of representing something and making fun and irony, it's a very, very possible approach, uh, you know? So you go somewhere else. And that's what is very different from, uh, from Schlingensief to other postmodern artists, because they kind of stayed in this ironic moment. I like it to start it up with irony over identification, big brother, uh, yeah. uh, et cetera, et cetera, all the media cliches, you know? But he went somewhere completely else, like a public ritual of responsibility. And this is this is great. This is Greek theater somehow, you know? Exactly. I was going to say that. <laughs> it's Greek theater, yeah, yeah. It's an interesting no. response because I would have thought that you would both have been a bit more critical, maybe, although there is something in what you say now, Mino, where you end. Because if you were saying, Tanya, that um, it's about uh, acting upon a world as you would wish the world to be, or you feel this would be a more just world, then in a way, his approach is much more cynical, no? Yeah, but at the same time, before you go there, you have to show people how how double moral they are and how hypocritical they are and how fucked up they are. Mm -hmm. So before you have to, you, you construct, you have to deconstruct, no? I'm guessing. Interesting. You have to destroy before you build. We have to be this pain in the asses, so that's what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> and I think art should be more real. And that's what he has, as, as Milo was saying, that the piece is real. The, the emotions were real. The, the, the problem is that reality is not real. The, I, mean, <laughs> we could see, I didn't see people dying from Corona. I didn't see them in the streets. I didn't exactly. see the Amazon burning. I didn't see, you know, this is all happening, but it's not real. So this is the work of art, not only of art, of course, but for me as an mm. artist, to translate it into reality. Thank you, that's beautiful. Uh, it's interesting to hear two people that are also so much, let's say, criticizing power, that also, I guess, <laughs> understand the, um, the machinery, uh, how power also operates. And because in the end, what is real 
I mean, power is, uh, I guess, being able to decide what is re what's real. And, 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 and so maybe it's also about uh, what kind of power we can use in order for, let's say, um, our art projects uh, to become more real than reality or what we have been deciding uh, to, to look at as reality. Thank you so much. Uh, Tania Bruguera, Milo Rao, it was a, a great pleasure. Um, thank you so much for 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 sharing your thoughts um, on this in this weird and and strange and and hopeful and pessimistic times on the on the same time. Um, let's stay in contact and try to really change this world and be, 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 be um, pin the asses, as uh, Tania said. Um, just a, a technical. Uh, in two weeks, the School of Resistance will be back with uh, Fondana Shiva and with Vanessa Nakate uh, talking about um, the post-COVID or with COVID-19 world uh, from an environmentalist uh, point of view. Thank you so much again. Thank you uh, so much. Thank you. Take care and be healthy. It's a pleasure meeting you guys. <laughs> Ciao. 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 Bye.